an epic adventure. The big sky and wide open spaces of the West. A legendary cattle drive. Cowboy heroes larger than life. Brave adventurous women. A boy and a nation coming of age. Lonesome Dove, the highest rated miniseries in history. Captivated audiences and compelled critics to call it a television masterpiece. Based on Larry McMurtry's Pulitzer Prize winning novel, Lonesome Dove tells the story of two lifelong friends, former Texas Rangers Gus McRae and Woodrow F. Cole, who take off on the adventure of a lifetime. Why not go up to Montana? The gentleman's paradise to hear Jake tell it. Sounds like a damn wilderness if you ask me. They round up a herd and head north to Montana, 2,500 miles away. Along the trail, they're battered by storms, cross snake-infested rivers, and trek for miles without water. They find new romance and old love. They take on horse thieves, outlaws. Trip off them duds. And, and it comes from uh, as close to the source as a writer can get, a, a writer that's living today. It's a great American epic which happens to be set in the West. Well, Larry wrote it with uh, Peter Bogdanovich originally as a, a theatrical vehicle for Henry Fonda, John Wayne, and James Stewart, but they never could make that work. So Larry stuck it on the shelf for another six or seven years. And then when he took it off the shelf, he he rewrote it and expanded it hugely, you know, into the novel Lonesome Dove. And it's really a saga of the West. It really tells the story in a different, in a different light than any Western I've ever seen. And plus, it was a fabulous book. It's simply one of those books that you couldn't put down. I think I read it for three solid days, and, and you know, and towards the end, you know, couldn't, couldn't bear to finish it, so I'd put it down and run off and do something and then come back to it. But it's it's... It's, it's like a wonderful meal that you can't bear to be over. Academy Award-winning actor Robert Duvall makes a rare television appearance as Gus McRae. At first, they approached me for the other part, and I said, you know, I wanna, I've done that. Let me, let me try this other part. It's the kind of part I've done on stage before, but never like in a film, that kind of outgoing guy. And I said, uh, that's the only part I want to do. So I said, give it to me. Let me run with it. I'm ready, you know. I'll, I'll, I got in good shape, and that was it. Hey, camera, Mark. Maybe Gustus McGray is my favorite character I've ever played. Because I could bring, you know, many sides to the guy. This guy was out. He was like a libertine. He was uh, happy-go-lucky. He lived the moment in his own personal way to the fullest, each moment of, of each day, even if it was boredom. I felt it was a privilege to play that part. Great part. Maybe so Gustus McGray is my favorite character I've ever played. At least as good as Hamlet. I like a shot of whiskey and so would my companion. It ain't too much trouble. Howdy, boy, you got a good game going there? Who the hell's that? 
You got mud in your ears or what? Fryer, what'll it be, old timer? Rye will do, provided it gets here quick. You darn cowboys ought to broom yourselves off before you walk in here. Get all the sand we need without the customers bringing it in. That'll be a dollar. Augustus McCraig walked into a into a Shakespearean play to hold his own as an interesting personality. Now, besides the whiskey, I think we'll require a little respect. Now, I'm Captain Augustus McCrae. This is Captain Woodrow F. Carl. Now, if you care to turn around, you can see how we looked when we was younger and the people around here wanted to make us senators. Now, the thing we didn't put up with then was dawdling service. Right, they were interesting guys, really, the Texas Rangers. Like, off-duty. Some of them were lawyers, poets, writers. They put on plays. They were sh sharp guys, a lot of them. But they, like, they had that vigilante thing about them. And they had to be, they had to be killers. Martin. And yet they were, you know, interesting. That's what McMurtry got in the book and in the, in the, in, in Bill Whitliffe got in the script as well, is the the sensitive side of these guys, it wasn't all one side. So there was a, you know, emotional side to them, like you sometimes don't see in movies. When was you the happiest, Carl? And then he has it seen later in Clara's Orchard, where it's a little emotional for him, reminiscing about the one woman he could never get, and that's what the very reason he's on the cattle drive is to go see Clara up there in Ogallala, Nebraska. Ah, God, God, you... you. I expect it was a mistake of my life. Letting her slip away like I did. <laughs> well, you've always got your whores. Yeah, I guess I do. I would like to find those those moments when I'm working, especially in a guy like what I tried to do with Augustus McCray and, and you know, go along with the character and when something happens, boom, it happens. There was one scene in particular where Jake is hung. It was okay, and the director said, let's try it again. So we did it again, and something happened fantastic for me. Well, adios, boys. Hope you won't hold it against me. Never meant no harm. <laughs> something happened to me that it was so emotional but I, and I didn't predict it it just something took over me like and it was a very real thing it was one of the best moments I've ever had in my career yes sir he died fine didn't he Emmy Award winner Tommy Lee Jones stars as Captain Woodrow F. Cole. He's uh, been a law enforcement officer most of his life, That's, and, um, he all, and, and to a certain extent always will be. Um, he's a leader, a leader of men, uh, uncomfortable in towns, uncomfortable in the company of uh, ladies, believes in, um, in the great struggle between good and evil, and he's on the side of good. Wants, uh, wants the world to be good, has an idea of what, the, what a fine place the world could be if people would just act right. Not everybody does, and those are the ones that uh, he wants to talk to. black and white story there are variations of goodness and evil and and we learn that through the as we follow each character through um, this long journey from uh, the Rio Grande River to uh, Montana we learn that evil is sometimes with us when we don't know it and we find that the same thing is true of goodness 
They participated in many situations where their lives depended upon one another. They have a lot in common. They pretty much dedicated their lives to uh, civilizing Texas. I guess they may have forgot us, though. Well, why wouldn't they forget us? Hadn't been around here in years. No, the reason is we never got killed. That's why they forgot us. That is a dang foolish thing to say. No, it ain't. If a thousand Comanches had cornered us in a gully somewhere and wiped us out like the Sioux just done cost us, why, they'd remember us, sure. Hell, they'd be writing songs about us for a hundred years. Hell, there never was a thousand Comanches in one much in the whole world, you know it. That ain't the point, Woodrow. What is it, then? Well, there are opposites in many ways. Gus is uh, an extrovert. Carl is an introvert. Um, Carl loves to work. Gus hates it. Uh, Gus loves to joke. Carl doesn't joke very much. Fun's all over down here for sure now, ain't it? Fun? What would you know about fun, Woodrow? You never had no fun in your whole darn life. Fun is my department. And now that you're back, I think I'll ride into town, see if I can't scare me up a little bit of it. We got enough to do right here without you riding off the town. Well, I'm just trying to keep everything in balance, Woodrow. You do more work than you got to, so it's my obligation to do less. Popular film star Danny Glover plays expert tracker Joshua Dietz. I read the script, which is roughly 400 pages. And it held my interest, it moved me, it, it had me thinking. Um, I mean, I, I, I like that about something that I do, that, that the thought process goes further than just, just the character or the question of how good the character is or whatever. But the process of men, we're all, we're all going through the same struggle. We all come on this earth, we all become part of nature. In becoming part of nature, that struggle that that Carl and Gus go through and able to verbalize in the film, no doubt is the same struggle that Dietz goes through as well. Find any water? Yes, sir. Well. 80 miles, Captain. Well, we ain't turning back. I, I, I spent a lot of time riding the, when I first arrived and just listening, just hearing and getting from, becoming familiar with, with the terrain, becoming familiar with the, uh, the elements and, and the very natural things about the environment. Just sitting in the saddle spurs the imagination in a way and and crossing rivers and and listening just listening and watching and, and taking in everything around you camps are here draw with a little water i make a basic assumption that that uh, that even 100 years ago people 150 years ago 120 years ago 10 years ago people may have felt the same things they're starving captain they done cut up one horse already. I got you mean. They stole our horses for me. They're real poor. Hell, they just had a picnic. We had one ourselves the other day without nobody shooting at us. I ain't gonna shoot them. Just gonna scare them off so we can get our horses back. We'll leave them two Unique Myers down in there. They ain't them. <laughs> Boy's flying, he can't see nothing. Deeds don't, don't, Deeds. Oh, hush up, little fella. Oh, you're gonna be all right. Deeds gonna take care of you. When you're dealing with a situation where the person you want next to you is the person you, you want to count on in any kind of situation that arises, and you want to be able to count on them and trust his reaction, then you hire people 
based upon their skills. And a lot of those people were black people. Celebrated Australian feature film director, Simon Wenser. I'm not preconditioned by Hollywood westerns and stuff like that. So I think I've brought a fresh look to the, the whole sort of western genre, if you like. And after all, this is um, uh, hopefully a revival of the western. And, and uh, we've really gone back to the, the history books and, uh, um, and not gone for the kind of Hollywood costumes and the way they wear their guns in, in the Hollywood westerns and stuff, but really how it was. And, you know, that's been forgotten over the years, I think. And Americans have never been very good at looking at their past, I think, accurately. And uh, hopefully in Lonesome Dove, we're doing that. Well, you'll have to reframe the shot. Certainly the biggest thing that I've ever done, and I guess for any film director, it's probably as big as they come. But it's being made on a television schedule, which is 16 weeks. And basically in that 16 weeks, we're making four films and every scene is large and has, you know, animals. And um, there are 89 speaking parts in the film. And uh, a normal day for us with the herd would be upwards of 300 cattle, 17 actors mounted, a couple of pigs and a few wagons thrown in as well. What we've tried to do, we have nine different towns. You know, each town has a different look. People have jobs. People aren't just walking about the streets. They're doing things. Yeah, I don't think that a lot of people have spent the money or, or just taken the trouble to do before that kind of detail. You know, we've got a terrific production design team who are really uh, very supportive and, and uh, want to get it absolutely right too. Get, get me up. Go me up. Back down, back down. Simon's a flusterated horse trainer himself, I believe. Whoa, 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 yeah. He's got a knack about photographing animals. At night, when we'd get done on Lonesome Dove, when we had all the cattle and everything, and he'd already, I mean, he'd probably worked harder than any of us on the show, but he'd get on a horse at night and help us drive the cattle back to the holding pens. I mean, it, uh, he loves it. He loves the West. He, he loves animals, and uh, it shows up on the, on the pictures that he does, too. Simon did such a wonderful job getting the landscape and you get a feel of just how hard it was to survive. Acclaimed film actress Diane Lane plays Lorena Wood. I wanted to play Lorena because she's such a dichotomy of emotions. Here she is doing what she does. She gets paid for her services, a sporting gal. I kind of like it, don't you? You been with her? Sure, who Don't go up there with him, please. Don't. I have to. You and me. How about a poke? I'm with Jake now, Gus. You knew that. She's so yeah. frail emotionally. But you don't realize that until you bring her out of Lonesome Dove into a world she's never experienced before. She's always previous to when you see her in the screenplay in the book. Her history is she's been taken care of by men, and that was it. And mistreated or not, she's always been sheltered. I want to go to San Francisco. That's what I want. Lori, listen to me now, pretty little thing. You see, life in San Francisco is still just life. Now, if you want only one thing too much, it's likely to turn out a disappointment. Now, the only healthy way to live it, I see it, is to learn to like all the little everyday things. <sighs> yeah, like what? Like a sip of good whiskey of an evening, or a soft bed, or a glass of buttermilk. Or say, uh, a feisty gentleman like myself. I wanted to work with Duval. Now you close your pretty little eyes, you're gone. That was a really wonderful experience for me to work with him. He was very generous and we had a great rapport. 25, don't, don't open 26. Hey, 27. <laughs> Come on, woman. I hope you can swim. I can't swim. Like the boat. About 30 seconds. 
When she leaves on the trail, she gets blasted with these experiences. Ah! What'd she do? I ah! said, what'd she do to earn a kick? You mind your own self? Ah! Ah! <laughs> You're not worth selling. The coyotes can have you. She could be broken and damaged and finished. Her broken spirit, want to die, that kind of feeling. If uh, Gus Duval's character wasn't her Literally, her knight in shining armor. They shouldn't have took me, Gus. <laughs> I know, honey. But they did. Oh. 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 Sure. Oh. Oh. But they did. They did. <laughs> now, you, you just go on right out. See, you got a long time to live. And you don't want this thing dragging you back, see? So you just cried on that old Gus. And you'll be all right here, right here. You're safe now. Academy Award winner Angelica Houston plays Clara Allen. McMurtry's um, done a tremendous amount for for the woman in, in, in Westerns. Um, by mere fact that, that he's given all of us very defined characters and, and um, entered into our entered into these characters as, as fully as he's entered into the men's. Speaking of death, Mama. You're doing everything you can for him. Somebody's coming. Clara Allen is Gus's longtime love. She lives near Ogallala on the way to, to Montana. She's um, a rancher's wife. Her husband is sick. He's been kicked in the head by a horse. She's got two daughters. She's his sort of ideal. And had been, they'd been childhood sweethearts, so he comes back. Your mama works you hard? Uh -huh. Where's your mama right now? She's outside. Well, pretty as ever. <laughs> Mom. We're both pretty honest. She calls him half honest, but I think you know there's a there's a basic understanding. There's um, a deep and old friendship. There's um, there's the affection that you have for for someone that you loved a long time ago that never really goes away. <laughs> you think you know so much about women, Gus, but you don't. You're way overrated in that regard. I got that you're sassy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm honest. You always yeah. did take that for being sassy. I always thought she was a bit of a rebel in, in her time. And she's doing her husband's work and her own, too. So there's a certain sort of freedom about how she moves and how she looks and it's not it's not um straight laced a, a pioneer woman i think is, is really used to sometimes it seems like grave digging's all we do around here don't it cholo what do you think happens when we die mm, not too much you are just dead Maybe it's not as big a change as we think. Maybe you just go back to where you lived or near family or wherever you was happiest. She's seen a lot of trouble in her time. She's lost three boys. She's a very original character, wonderful character. Um, extremely passionate. Did you give that boy your name before you left Montana? You gave him my heart. You gave him your horse, not your name. I put a lot more value on the animal than I do my name. Look at me, Captain Cole. I'm sorry you and Gus McRae ever met. 
All you ever did was ruin each other, not to mention those closest to you. I love Gus, but I wasn't going to fight you for him every day of my life. I despised you then for what you were, and I despise you now for what you're doing. She's um, very honest, very straightforward, very judgmental. I liked her a lot. Golden Globe winner and television star Rick Schroeder plays Newt. Well, Newt's, I guess, the youngest cowboy on the cattle drive. He's Captain Call's son. And the thing I like about Newt so much, uh, why I really wanted to play him, is because he has the most growth uh, th through, this, through, this, through this film. It, it takes place over 17 to 20. Captain, how far is it up north? Well, up north ain't a place, Newt. It's a direction. Where we're going is about 2,500 miles that way. 2,500 miles? So, um, so he starts out as a young boy, and along the cattle drive, he grows up to be a man. So it really fits me perfectly, because, I mean, I'm changing from a boy to a man. Captain, next time you go over to Mexico, can I go? I believe I'm getting old enough now. You get old quick and keep sitting around all night, talking. Best go on to bed. He experiences love. Howdy, ma'am. <laughs> well, what can we do for you boys? Come on, cowboy. Skin them pants off. We ain't got all day for you little pants off. The experience is death. Ain't nothing much we can do, Newt. It's been bit too many times. No. So Newt and I are really one person. But you know, I, I use my, my emotions, I use my feelings, and that's what comes out in Newt. So I mean, the things he's feeling right now in the script is what I'm feeling in my own life. It's also a Western, which is a lot of fun. I mean, you get to wear a gun, you can see, I, I mean, I love twirling my gun, and riding horses and getting in fights. I mean, that's what this is all about. You know, when you have actors like Robert Duvall and, um, and Danny Glover and Tommy Lee Jones, you can't go wrong. And they, they, they I guess they like me, and they, they, we talk about acting, we talk about techniques, and we talk about all this fabulous stuff. I would basically get paid nothing to work with them, but, you know, luckily I'm getting paid. <laughs> Wrangler Rudy Ugland. As far as casting of the animals in the show, you know, we probably had... Uh, 25 or 30 principals on that show and some of them I mean even though they look like cowboys on the film some of those people had never been on a horse before in their life it was murder it was murder for someone who's never ridden before for I guess nine days I was <laughs> learning how to horseback ride but now I love it they were good students and they they learned to ride real well we, we spent a lot of time with them and picked out the right horse for them and made them look like a cowboy. And when they finished that show, they were cowboys. <laughs> There's a scene where um, I have to bulldog a big longhorn down. I actually grab it around the horns and grab it by the neck and twist its neck and throw this 300 pound bull down. If Bobby Duvall worked on a ranch, he'd probably be the best cowboy on the ranch. When you look for a horse for him, you're actually looking for a horse that a cowboy would ride. You're not looking for trigger or nothing fancy like that. You're looking for a cowboy's horse. That one shot with Bobby where he was riding across the, the plains in search of the Indians, here Bobby come riding in on this horse and they fired off a couple squibs in front of him. And boy, I'm gonna tell you what, this horse went to wolfing it up. I didn't particularly like it and the head stuntman was very, very nervous because if I get hurt, that's it. And if it had been any other actor except Bobby Duvall, it could have, might have been a bad wreck. They left it in the picture, and I, I, I think that's what made that picture so great, is because everything was real in it. Tommy's horse was a, a horse that was an outlaw, a bronc. Captain called, he wanted a horse that was feisty, and had a lot of go to it. Basically, the horse that he rode in that, in that show was that type of horse. This horse might buck you off at any time, I mean, in real life. And he got along fine with him. He done a, he done a really a good job with it. 
we had a herd of anywhere from three to 600 head of cattle and we caught, probably kept about 85, 90 horses on the show. The town stuff that we did, we probably brought in another, you know, 50, 60 head of horses and wagons and, you know, usually start on a picture a couple months in advance just to find these animals that can handle the terrain where you're gonna go. We spent weeks teaching them to drive, teaching them to swim, teaching them to be around a movie company that with lights and cameras. We never heard a horse or, or a cow or a pig on that whole show. And it's a good feeling when you know that you've done a job where you never hurt animals. And, you know, and then there's the feeding of them, the care of them and the cowboys and the wranglers that don't ever get in front of that camera that's that are up at four o'clock in the morning to prepare these things to get to work by seven. And then after work is finished at six that night, you know, finishing up and finally unsaddling their horses at nine thirty, ten 10 o'clock at night. We had some awful short nights on that show and some awful long days. We had uh, four sets of pigs and they went from a month old to six months old to a year old to two years old, to two and a half years old, because they went all through the whole picture from Texas all the way to Montana. And so they undertake this epic journey too. And not only do they do what the cattle do, they get caught in blizzards and dust storms and swim across rivers and so forth. Look at them pigs swim. <laughs> they become, you know, lovable characters like many other characters in the piece. They're terrific. Most of the actors didn't like working with the pigs because they know that when the pigs are on screen, they haven't got a chance. <laughs> I say that jokingly, of course, but they're, they're wonderful. And I think uh, the audience will really love them because uh, they're involved in many humorous situations. Costume designer, Van Broughton Ramsey. Basically, what I'm supposed to do is to read the script talk to the director, and then interpret what he wants by sketches. A lot of this was based on photographs. This was Robert Duvall. The amount of research that, that Robert Duvall had done was staggering. I'm taking Duvall's hat we had narrowed down to basically three different styles, and he tried them on to see which one he liked. So he took the hats and he went, this one, no, this one, no, this one, yes. It was a perfect hat. You know, when you put it on, you know it. You just know it, and like everything else revolves around that. And then the boots were made by some guys in LA. It was all one piece of leather. And in that day and age, uh, they wore the boots on the outside, and they weren't quite the, the advent of the Western boot. As we know it today, the cowboy boot hadn't come to be. Tried to give everybody in it a, a unique look. This was like one of the dresses for Diane Lane and one of the things we came up with for Angelica Houston. The women characters were pretty much based on diaries from women and um, on choices of clothes that they might have worn and then some from photographs. Until I'm dressed and, the, and I'm on set, it's, it's hard for me to, to, to really get a bearing on, on what the character is um, or a lot of it. And in this case, I, I kept finding myself running back and forth to wardrobe and saying, do you have a hat? Newt, see that little sorrel over there with the star on his forehead? I want you to have him. Thank you very much, ma'am. Newt was interesting because he was basically the youngest of all of them. And we were trying to show a progression of, of, of him from being a young, young boy and not having very much responsibility, being taken along on this cattle drive to becoming the head, the kind of overseer of this ranch once they got there. We did that mainly through his hat because he was like wearing a discarded hat, a hat that really didn't fit him, that was oversized and it was obvious that someone had given this to him. And then when he finally got to Montana, he, he had his own hat and developed you know, a sense of style about himself. 
we kind of had to imagine what, what are these clothes really going to go through? I mean, are these the only clothes that these guys own? And if they've been on a horse for a year, well, then you really beat it up. Ain't no point in getting too clean, boys. You'll be neck deep in the New Aces River before dark. And you try to simulate what kinds of things is this person exposing his clothes to and what kind of dirt does he ride through? Sometimes there would be scenes when they actually had to ride through the dust storms and they, they bring out these enormous Ritter fans and huge sacks of dust and just dump the, dump the dust in front of the fans and let it go over everyone again. So, I mean, they were just they were just covered and so was the crew. I mean, you had everyone using their bandanas. I mean, you, you just couldn't tell people apart. Screenwriter and executive producer Bill Whitliff. Humor plays a real big part in this, in this film, but it is, it is a humor that comes through character. I mean, the humor, when it comes through character, comes through that specific character rather than being humor that's laid on just to get a smile or a laugh. I mean, it's an integral part of the story. It's an integral part of, of uh, the character. That's a dang stupid thing to do, bringing that old sign along. You'll have us at laughing stock this whole country with that. We don't rent pigs, part. Well, we don't rent pigs. And I figure it's better to say it right up front, because a man that does like to rent pigs is he's hard to stop. And if that ain't bad enough, you get all them Greek words on there, too. I told you, Woodrow, a long time ago, it ain't Greek, it's Latin. What does it say at Latin? Well, it's a motto. It just says itself. Yo varum, yo varum feet, yo varum double feet, yo whatever. You don't have no idea what it says. You found that in some old book or something. Broad, you know it invites people to rob it. Well, first man comes along that can read Latin is welcome to rob as far as I'm concerned. I'd like the chance to shoot at an educated man once in my life. It's humor that's very, very authentic to the time. You know, when it was a rough kind of humor. I mean, where the only way you could get through some of those situations where people were dying and, and uh, getting crushed under horses and so on was to find a way to smile at it and go on. God, that's enough. That is enough. Is he shooting at us? Uh, he can't hit nobody from there. He's just wasting his bullets. Maybe an old man like you can use a better target. Production designer, Carrie White. There was a tremendous effort made toward being just as authentic as we possibly could be with the story. And we, it would have been easier to shoot it perhaps on some other place, but we did shoot it, built the town of Lonesome Dove right on the, uh, the banks of the Rio Grande. You'd look over there and there was Mexico. It's described in the book as a dried up little part of the town on the banks of the Rio Grande. This is the little bird's eye view of the town of Lonesome Dove that I did originally just from reading McMurtry's description. We wanted to keep it just real simple, real stark, just as bleak and barren as possible. Here's a illustration of the Hat Creek headquarters, little adobe building. I wanted it to have, have uh, be all shored up where the pigs have been digging under the front porch. Here's a, just a a sketch that I did of uh, Gus and uh, Jake Spoon uh, at the Spring House. We did as much research as we possibly could. Our primary source was really the, uh, the photographs that we could find. You'd do some adapting and 
basically come up with the design. It's like casting for, for parts in the show. It's such a complex story that working with an Australian director, he wasn't that familiar with the geography of the U.S., so Simon asked me to uh, draw him a map. What we did was try to find different terrain that would match where we were supposed to be because we did not make this trip from here to here. We went from, we went from Austin to down to Del Rio up to northern New Mexico, and we had to make it look like it was covering the entire country. So, like, for example, when we shot Clara's Ranch outside of uh, Ogallala, Nebraska, it should have been real flat. We actually shot it outside of Santa Fe. We were very careful in picking the angles to avoid the, the mountains as much as possible. Then we built barns and outstructures to mask out other mountains. The cabin that the, uh, the Hat Creek Outfit builds up in Milk River, we got uh, this character named Neil Bowie, who's a log uh, cabin constructor, builds these hand handmade log cabins, and uh, if it looks real, it's because old Neil was there instructing these guys how to build it. Push it up. Neil Bowie, he, he dug the dugout log canoe for us that was seen in Bent's Fort and looked just terrific. This is a, a drawing of the uh, whiskey boat, which was actually a uh, a barge that they use in Austin, Texas, that we uh, sort of remodeled into a 1800s whiskey boat. This is a drawing of the courthouse in Santa Rosa, New Mexico, where Blue Duck takes his dive. <laughs> this is um, a drawing of the Alamo, and our heroes ride by the Alamo when they are make their little side trip to San Antonio to pick up a cook. Oh, it's real exciting to, uh, to see it come to life because you start off with just words on a page and uh, then it, it takes on a visual form and then it becomes a concrete form and you know, then you've got people in it and it's, the cameras are rolling and when you see it on film, it's a wonderful thing to behold. Stunt coordinator, Bill Burton. Everybody wanted to do Lonesome Dove. Every stuntman, every wrangler, every cowboy in the United States wanted to do Lonesome Dove. 187 Apple, take two. My favorite scene in the whole movie was the fight between Carl and, and the scout. We blocked the whole scene two, three days in advance with Tony and myself and Tommy Lee Jones, uh, step by step. Action! Tommy, obviously, wants to do all of his own stunts, and, and in that particular scene, he did. He actually rode the gray, uh, what they call the hell bitch, down the street and ran it into a, a black falling horse, which Tony Ipper was riding, and, and it was like throwing a punch at the camera. He never made contact with the black horse. And the remarkable thing that you couldn't do if you had that double, doubling Tommy, was he stepped right off the hell bitch went around and kicked Tony in the face. So if we'd have had to double uh, Tommy Lee in that sequence, he would have, uh, we'd have to make a cut, of course. So that was a nice plus, having someone as handy as uh, Tommy Lee is. And then we did the whole fight. We blocked it all out days in advance and, and rehearsed it. Every move was blocked and executed, every swing with the branding iron, every punch, every kick. The only thing that wasn't rehearsed was when uh, uh, Bobby Duvall has to ride in and rope Tommy Lee and pull him off, Tony, Action. to uh, uh, save his life. Uh, the scene in the, in the beginning of the movie that, that we did where they steal, go into Mexico and steal the horses and was done at the actual location. All these horses and all these cattle, they all have a mind of their own. It's not like a car chase or a motorcycle scene where you turn the key off or, 
or turn the gas off, these horses, uh, you know, and they were wild horses, they pretty much do what they want to do. And, and t it takes a couple of nights of chasing them just to even get them uh, honed in and, and tired enough to where they're responding to you and, and, and get them trained which direction to run in the film. So you've got to stampede horses right by your lens and right by musco lights and stuff. All they want to do is go the other way. And you talk about, you know, a couple hundred head loose horses uh, want, all wanting to go 200 different directions and you've got 10 people trying to control them. Uh, tough job. I had a horse uh, go fall down and go right out from underneath me. In fact, it's still in the film. It wasn't featured. And it, if you look in the, in the stampede at night, you see this little horse off to the... I believe it's the left-hand side of your frame, fall and go down, rolled over me, and and I was uh, sore for a long time after that. It really hurt me. And, uh, you know, of course, the horse falls down, rolls over the top of me, he gets up and runs off, and then you've got a couple of hundred, hundred head of horses right behind you that you've got to run for cover. And then we bring the horses literally across the Rio Grande into the United States and right up the main street of Lonesome Dove. To me, it was, uh, it was the old West. It was America. There's a huge variety of characters in this thing, both good and bad, both male and female both white and Indian and Mexican and so on. I mean, it, it's an absolute panorama of, of the West. It's a grand adventure and, and great entertainment. That's why people will watch it. It's, I think it's fabulous. As a book, it was great. And as television, I don't think you'll find anything much more entertaining than this. All right. Hell no, ain't all right. Rather well made and very beautiful. It's exciting and adventurous and, and funny and heartbreaking. Those are all excellent ingredients for uh, improving an audience's time. I want to see that country. Boy, uh, bankers and lawyers all get it. All my cowboy friends, they watch it every day. I know guys that come home from punching cows at night and they turn it on. They only might watch a half hour, but they'll watch it. Build a ranch in this little valley right here. I've seen it uh, two or three times now already, and every time I see it, I I get a chill down my spine because it's it's not a movie; it's real. It's epic. It's about love. It's about life. It's about violence. It's about men and women. It's about um, overcoming fear. It's about bravery, it's about adventure. Um, it's, 